Welcome everyone to uh, worship, worship service and welcome to our online community watching from home. two years of not meeting in person for Christmas Eve because of COVID, but Mother Nature had a different uh, different plan. But um, I'm not ready to give up Christmas and Epiphany hymns yet. <laughs> so, so let's sing this um, wonderful, wonderful Christmas Epiphany hymn, the first Noel. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. 1, 2, 3, and 5.
together in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, in baptism you promise us forgiveness and new life. We confess that we often prefer our old ways. We resist the new opportunities you set before us. We cling to the harmful habits and nurse grudges, failing to forgive one another. Have mercy upon us, O oh God, and guide us to live with more grace and generosity through Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Before the world was made, we were chosen in Christ to be part of God's family. God calls us to new life in Christ. So trust in God's forgiveness and grace. Turn and follow Jesus in repentance and joy. Thanks be to God. Grace and Emmett, perfect timing. I need the kids to come forward. That was so perfect. or you can just listen from your seats. That's okay, too. Star Wars! Not Star Wars, Troy and Abby. I know you're big Star Wars fans. But Star Words this time. We're going to talk about um, Star Words. And... Another word for star words are star gifts. And it's a spiritual practice. Now, spiritual practices means ways that we can become closer to God. So some people might have a specific time of day that they pray, maybe first thing in the morning or before a meal. Maybe sometimes people read the Bible before bed or they use the our daily bread or another devotion as a spiritual practice. I know some people who walk in the woods for their spiritual practice, or walk along the beach, or I know some people that get together with one of their friends and they read a scripture and then they discuss it. Any other spiritual practices anyone has that I can share? <clears throat> this, yes, listening to music. Gospel music, other music, yes. Another spiritual practice are star words or star gifts. And it is a uh, connected to epiphany, and that's a big word. That means the time that we remember when the three wise men followed a star, follow some gods, the stars up here, followed a star to Bethlehem and brought gifts to the baby Jesus. And so these star words are on a popsicle stick. There's a whole bunch of words, okay? And I have, I have Abby to thank for helping make them because Abby came over to our house for a, what she thought was a play date. And I, <laughs> I turned out making it craft time and child-free labor time <laughs> to get ready for something.
If you look at it and go, I don't like that word, you can't put it back and trade it in for another one. <laughs> my daughter, my daughters tried that. I just didn't want to pick their words out. And um, Claire got stability, and Lauren got listen. Chris got endurance. And, and I haven't picked mine. Oh, I did. I did. I picked mine in Battersea. Mine's rise up. Rise up is my star word. So um, you're... Some of these got kind of flipped over on the ride over here. So um, the best way, uh, the kids can pick theirs now, but the adults, when you come up for communion, the basket will be here. Close your eyes, pick one, and don't, don't trade, and then that's going to be your star word for a year. Put it somewhere where you see it every day, okay? And it's a way of... Um, Maybe helping you make, maybe you have a difficult decision to make, and then you can meditate on your word, think it, maybe your word will help you. Or maybe it's a way of your prayer time. You can use the word for your prayer time. And it allows consistent reflection on how God has moved through, around, and in connection to that word. It's been very popular in the Protestant church for a decade. I just heard about it last year. And the colleagues and the congregations I've heard that used it found it a very, very rich experience. So last year I wrote myself a note, and I really want to introduce this to uh, Inverary and Battersea um, in, in 2023. There are five reasons why this is a, has like a theological um, backing to this practice. One, the Magi followed a star, which ultimately led them to Jesus. Therefore, two, we use all the resources we have available to us, including creative prayer practices, to, so it helps, this will help us move closer to Jesus. Second, we trust that God uses multiple ways to guide us and speak to us, and star words are just another way that we look for God. We look for God in our daily life. Three, we trust that it's often easy to miss God. Some truth is hard to hear God's calling to us. So this is a way that by having a guiding word to consider both present day, but then at the end of the year, you can kind of reflect on your word and review the last year uh, with that word in mind. So we believe that star words invite a new way of prayer, reflection, and review that can be powerful for us to connect with God. Also, by not um, looking and sorting through the star words, um, we practice the spiritual task of receiving. It's not uh, we are who are in control in this moment. We put our trust in God, in the spirit, that God might guide us to a word that we might need to, to guide us. I've had many people say, after they pick their word at Battersea and other, when I've heard colleagues do this, that they're like, wow, I was meant to have that word this year. So it'll be interesting to see what you choose. Um, so it is, it's a way of letting go our control and think, oh, I know what resolutions I need to work on this year, da 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 just trust in this process to, uh, to pick a word that's appropriate for you. Often, lastly, often prayer time is using our, like, we speak, we talk, we read prayers, we say prayers, maybe out loud, but this is a way to be quiet, to hear God's call, and just to have some quiet time with God. So we believe that star words invite a new way of prayer. So, would you like to pick one? Pick one from the basket? And then everybody else, you're more than welcome. Ooh, so that says awe. Oh. And when, um, when, I think it was Claire and Lauren wrote that one, they said, what does awe oh mean? So awe oh kind of means wow. Like, so maybe think about things in your life that just kind of make you go wow. Is that a good way of describing it? Anybody else have a way of describing awe? No, oh, that's good. Wow. Yeah. So you, you're going to think about 
wow and what makes you go wow this year? Yeah, so that you put that maybe in your room or the bathroom, somewhere where you go every day. Okay? <laughs> Emmett gets, what's it say? Feel. Hmm. Feel. <clears throat> Emotions, yeah. Happy, sad. What makes you? So you can think about maybe your feelings this next year. Super. So everyone else, you're more than welcome after you come forward for communion and you take your crown, your juice, you can uh, come over here and not look and pick a star word. If you're not comfortable coming up for communion, but you want a star word, don't worry. They're going to stay up here after the service. You can come and, uh, and get one. There has been, in church, there are two sacraments. There are, um, there is uh, communion. We have communion. And we also have baptism. Communion and baptism are the two sacraments in the United Church. And we kind of going to talk about both of them today. We have uh, communion a little bit later on, and um, we have, we're going to talk about Jesus baptism during the sermon today. Communion, last month we had a really good talk about what communion means, and we used the um, baptism cube. We're going to use that cube again in the future. But in my readings over the holidays, I came across this description of communion, that I thought would really help kids and big kids wrap our heads around what communion means. What you eat becomes part of you, doesn't it? When you eat a meal, that becomes part of you. So when we say, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, we are doing this so that Jesus becomes part of us. That makes more sense, I think. So that Jesus becomes part of us. And when we all do it together, we become part of the same thing. And we call that being part of Jesus too. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. So what we eat becomes part of us. And when we say that this is Jesus, we mean we are doing this so that Jesus becomes part of us. Well, thank you. I know that was a long chill. We had a lot to cover today. But I'm excited to hear how your star words go throughout the year. And you can, well, I'll invite you back up for communion, but you can go back to your mom now. Thanks for coming up. And we'll now have our reading. Well, that, this, this is being moved. I was like, she's not in the back she's room anymore. <laughs> chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and 11 to 17. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Then at Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? 
But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And he said, Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let us sing Christ when for us you were baptized, hymn 99. Google, 
is to be bound to someone legally or morally. If we're obligated to someone, it can be with thanks and gratitude and appreciation because of what someone's done for us, or on the other hand, it can be a weight, can't it? It can be a, a burden, something that makes us feel trapped, what we owe to someone. If we think about our obligations, there are probably some that make us feel thankful and stir a sense of commitment, and there might be some that make us feel overwhelmed. What legal obligations do you have? Debts we owe or taxes we pay. What obligations do you have to people? To friends, to spouses, to children, to students, to teachers, to bosses, to neighbors. When you think about the obligations you have in your relationships, how do you feel about those commitments? Is your indebtedness in relationship one directional or mutual between both people? What kind of time obligations do you have? We are much obligated indeed. Or we are, and we're much obliged indeed. Much obliged. It's a complicated little phrase. Our gospel text for today has me thinking about obligations and what it means to be obligated. And in the Christian calendar, today is the baptism of the Lord Sunday, a day when we remember the baptism of Jesus. And the baptism of Jesus is kind of a conundrum. In the Gospels, Jesus' baptism takes place in the context of John the Baptist, baptizing many people in the Jordan River. And John has been preaching a pretty fiery message focused on this key passage, repent, for the realm of the heavens is near. And people respond to this message in just droves. Coming and asking for forgiveness. And being baptized as a sign of new life. But then Jesus comes to be baptized too. If baptism relates to repentance... A recognition that we're not going in God's direction, that we're not headed closer to God and we need to turn around and head back to God. And John the Baptist's theme word is certainly repentance. Why does Jesus need to be baptized? If Jesus is perfect, guiltless, he doesn't need to repent, right? This conundrum has plagued readers of the scripture for a long time. And evidently even plagued the writers of the scripture because in Mark's gospel, um, Jesus is being baptized and there's no seeming concern for uncomfortable questions. But in Matthew's gospel that Suzanne read for us, it includes a little exchange between Jesus and John where John himself seems uncomfortable baptizing Jesus. And John says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Although Jesus' response seems to be to kind of clear things up for John enough to go ahead and baptize Jesus. It didn't really clear things up for me. But then I read Dr. Will Gaffney's translation and interpretation of this text, and a light went on. In her translation, after Jesus said, let it go for now, for this way is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness, then John he let it go. He let it go. In her commentary, Gaffney notes that the words, let it go, 
sure the kids could sing Let It Go for us from Frozen right by now. Gaffney notes that the words let it go are weighty. Words that would serve to release an obligation as an illegal obligation. They could be used for divorce, right? For example, certainly a release from an obligation happens in divorce. Or here in Matthew, words canceling a legal objection. John has filed a verbal objection to baptizing Jesus, and Jesus tells him, let it go. I think this exchange between Jesus and John at Jesus' baptism is saying, figuring out the theological details of why I, Jesus, should be baptized when for others it's a sign of repentance is not the point here. The point here is that is what my baptism will do. It joins me to the human struggle, to the human faith journey in a concrete way, marking the beginning of my ministry in ritual. And John lets it go. Let's go of his objections. Let's go of holding Jesus and holding himself to the obligation of figuring out how and if it makes theological sense for someone like Jesus to be baptized. John lets go and baptizes Jesus. And as soon as John lets go and baptizes Jesus, the heavens open. And God sends her spirit down on Jesus like a dove descending. And God's voice is heard, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The letting go of the obligation, the clearing of the way for Jesus to be baptized, it results in the heavens opening and powerful, a powerful experience of God's presence and affirmation occurs. When John lets go of the obligation to have everything made perfect, logical, theological sense, when he lets go of some mental checklist he has for people who need to be baptized and why, when he makes space for Jesus to participate in a ritual, even though he doesn't believe Jesus needs it, the releasing of the obligation makes way for the movement of the Spirit, makes way for God to draw ever closer to God's creation, makes way for Jesus to begin his public ministry with the deep knowledge in his heart, that he is beloved. Have you ever experienced being set free from an obligation? When I was a fairly new minister, I had a pretty hefty student loan. And I remember when the Conference United Church Women's Group gave me a check that covered my balance. UCW were always generous and supportive of theological students. And I had many loans, but one loan um, was from the conference UCW group. So they would have been totally correct to hold me to the obligation that I'd agreed to when I took their money. <laughs> but they didn't. They let it go. When have you experienced being set free from an obligation? I wonder when our obligations are constraining us and others. When are they holding us back from God, holding us back from love, holding us back from relationship, joy, and thriving? When are the obligations that we have placed on others burdensome and restrictive in ways that act as stumbling blocks to relationship with God? Obligations, of course, are part of life. And obligations, even and especially challenging ones, shouldn't just be disregarded. Being obligated to one another is part of the way we love our neighbor. 
But the interaction between Jesus and John has me thinking about the theological obligations we hang on each other and ourselves. We have all sorts of ideas, don't we? All of us, about what it takes to be a good Christian. Committed disciples, dedicated followers. Our ideas might differ from each other depending on our theological perspectives. But most of us have these like mental checklists and requirements to be serving God in the right way. Sometimes what's on our checklist can shape us in positive ways, like spiritual disciplines, like our, our star words, practices that keep us close to God. But sometimes we turn our theological positions into obligations that are weighty, they are stumbling blocks that cause ourselves and others to stumble on our path with God. So what obligations can you let go of? And perhaps even more importantly, what, and what you have more power over, who can you free of, how, who can you free of an obligation that's burdening them? When you let go, what movement of God might you be making space for? And I think the possibilities are endless. So today we celebrate Jesus' baptism. And there are so many reasons why Jesus being baptized doesn't make sense. As John well knows, Jesus asked him to let it go and baptize anyway, and John did it. And God's spirit broke through in the midst of a very spiritual ritual. So how can we set each other free? Cancel indebtedness that binds, remove heavy burdens, and clear the pathways that we filled with obligations that are more about being right than about being righteous. How can we clear those pathways that we filled with obligations that are more about being right? And what might God do when we let go? can't wait to see. Amen. I mentioned earlier that I'm really um, not ready to let go of Christmas and Epiphany and New Year's songs. <laughs> so I had a request for Chris to sing Old Lang Syne. And he agreed. And he is going to um, sing it, though, during our communion service. So we'll move on to the invitation to the offering. Friends, God has commissioned us to spread the good news that God is at work in the world and that we are loved and we are blessed in Jesus' name. And we offer our gifts to God in thanksgiving for all this good news. And let's take a moment to dedicate our offerings that are on the back plate any offerings we've received this week or may come in the week ahead, let us pray. You, O oh God, have given us many gifts, the summer sun, the winter snow, the spring rains, and the colors of autumn. You give your spirit to all who believe, and now we give back to you a portion of your blessings for the work of Christ in the church. Amen. And our communion hymn is 101, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise.
or you can stay with your family. It's up to you. But the front row is is free is free for you. Um, a reminder that all are welcome to the table. Everyone, no matter where you are in your faith journey, your age, it, it doesn't matter. You're welcome to uh, to this table. And when it comes uh, time for um, for communion, I invite you to come to the uh, middle row, and I'll give you um, a cracker. You can help yourself to the juice, and then remember to make your way to um, the Star Wars table and uh, choose one. And anybody in our uh, online um, who are watching from home and you would like a Star Word, let me know. I've already had a couple people get wind that we were doing this and couldn't make it today, so they've asked if I would make sure I, I, I saved them one. So I'll be doing a few deliveries this week and happy to deliver to anybody that would like one um, who are not here in person today. And please join me in the communion liturgy found in your bulletin. This is an Epiphany communion service. And may God be with you. And also with you. Lift your hearts. We lift them out to God. Let us give thanks to the God we love. We pray to give God thanks and praise. It is right and beautiful that we should, in ceaseless joy, give our thanks and praise to you, holy and merciful God. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so, in grateful procession of endless praise, with the church that is, was, and shall be forever, we glorify you, joining this unending song as we sing. Jesus Christ. 
Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in your glorious creation, both now and forever. Amen. Let us sing the words that Jesus taught us.
We have been fed, Holy One, by your presence. We have been led, Eternal One, by your light. May we bask in this glow, now and forevermore. Amen. Will you come and see the light, hymn 96? Thank you. 